dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget under the Databases tab or type serp-p.pids.gov.pa. SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Social Economic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange in Policy Research Policies can either make or break a country and its people. Hence, they should be thoroughly studied and evaluated. This is where policy research comes in. Through Malacanang Proclamation 247, released in 2002, the government declared September as a Development Policy Research Month or DPRM. The DPRM aims to promote nationwide awareness of the importance of policy research in formulating evidence-based policies, plans, and programs. It also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and the use of data and evidence among decision makers and raise the public's literacy of socioeconomic issues. The proclamation also designated the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, to oversee and coordinate all activities related to the DPRM. Various activities such as policy forums, press conferences, social media promotion, and the annual public policy conference are organized by the PIDS and its partners to celebrate the DPRM. Each year, the DPRM focuses on a particular theme which is usually a current or an emerging development issue of national significance. In recent years, the DPRM has centered on issues about regulations, risk reduction and management, decentralization, the fourth industrial revolution, the new globalization, 
and the reforms needed to address the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. This year, to follow through on the 2020 and 2021 themes on rebuilding from COVID-19, DPRM 2022 focuses on the theme, hashtag close the gap, accelerate post-pandemic recovery through social justice. Through this theme, we wish to highlight how the pandemic severely affected the poor, the less educated, the subsistence and temporary workers, the elderly, persons with disabilities, and the indigenous peoples. COVID-19's extreme and disproportionate impacts on the marginalized and vulnerable sectors magnified and exacerbated deep-seated socioeconomic and political inequalities and cultural inequities in society. Breaking these inequalities and inequities and working toward a more just society is essential to successfully recover from the current pandemic and build the country's resilience to future shocks. Thus, this year's DPRM theme encourages our policymakers and leaders to make social justice the front and center of the post-pandemic recovery plan. Promoting social justice is everyone's responsibility. Together, let us build a just, inclusive, resilient, and progressive post-pandemic Philippines. Know more about the DPRM and how you can participate by visiting https colon double slash dprm.pideas.gov.ph. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahin problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga polisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga polisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making ipang bigyan din ang kalaghan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga kamundidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan!
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the opening program of the 8th Annual Public Policy Conference, or APPC. The APPC is the highlight of the Development Policy Research Month, which we are celebrating this September. I'm Sheila Ciar, your host. This virtual conference is organized by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies with support from the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Our, our APPC webinar series consists of four virtual sessions, and we will have the first webinar immediately after this opening program. To start our event, let us know more about the GPRM and APPC and this year's theme from the president of PIDS. May I call on Dr. Aniset Arbeta Jr. for his opening remarks. Sir? Thank you, Sheila. Socioeconomic Planning Secretary Arsenio Balisakan, officials of the National Economic and Development Authority and its regional offices, heads of the tax agencies, officials, and colleagues from other government agencies, representatives from the private sector, academic, business sector, civil society, international partners, and the media, good morning. As development practitioners, September is an opportune time for all of us to be reminded that policies and programs to be effective must be data-driven and well-studied. This is the main message of the Development Policy Research Month, or the PRM an annual celebration led by PIDS every September. Pursuant to Presidential Proclamation 247, the DPRM underscores the importance of policy research in crafting evidence-based plans, programs, and policies. Each year, in consultation with our partners in the DPRM steering committee, we decide on a theme which could either be a burning issue of the day or an emerging issue that would be important in, in the coming years. The chosen theme is, uh, is discussed in various activities organized by PIDS during the DPRM, including the DPRM Kickoff Forum, regional events, media appearances, and promotion via social media. Today, we are conducting the main event of the DPRM, the Annual Public Policy Conference, or APPC, which is now in its eighth year. Through the APPC, we examine the DPRM theme closely by convening renowned and international renowned international and local experts and policy analysts from various fields. And we, as well as representatives from government, academic, private sector, and civil society to share their insights on the issues, opportunities, and options uh, surrounding the theme. This year, we focus on the topic, hashtag close the gap, accelerate post-pandemic recovery through social justice to highlight the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our marginalized and vulnerable sectors, and why it is crucial to renew our commitment to social justice to ensure that no one is left behind as we recover from this pandemic. I mentioned renewing our commitment to social justice because social justice is not something new. It is enshrined in our constitution and development blueprints and various international declarations where the Philippines is a signatory. At PIDS, our studies are de de have delved into social justice as we investigate development issues in our social and economic sectors. From these studies, it is apparent that despite the past and present efforts to uplift the lives and well being of the marginalized and vulnerable sectors, the manifestations of lack of social justice, such as poverty and inequality, remain pervasive and have further worsened during the pandemic. Clearly, this means that we should not only do more we must also improve the design and deliver of our programs to make them more effective. We can do this by ensuring that our policies and programs are informed by policy research and guided by the tenets of social justice. This morning, we opened our four-part APPC web webinar series in a discussion, with a discussion on the concept of social justice in the 21st century. This webinar will follow shortly after this opening program. We'll discuss uh, how social justice can be strengthened and applied in a post-pandemic era, the policy measures that, we ha that have worked, and those that need to be fine-tuned to address social and economic and environmental inequalities. In the succeeding webinars in September 15, 20, and 22, we will unpack the, the PRM APBC team by discussing how it can be applied in three key policy areas, namely human capital development and social protection, health services and infrastructure, and environmental resilience and climate change. I want to thank our distinguished speakers and panelists for accepting our invitation to share their invaluable insights in today's webinar. 
by profound gratitude to Professor James Hickman, the 2000 Nobel Laureate in Economic Sciences, and University of Chicago's Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor of Economics and Director of the Center of Economics and Human Development for gracing our conference. We are deeply honored to have you with us. This is the first time that a Nobel Laureate has accepted our invitation, and it is truly worth the wait. I am humbled by the presence of two respected national academicians and economists, Dr. Raul Pobilia of the University of the Philippines School of Economics and Dr. Mahar Mahangas of the Social Weather Stations. They will join us in the panel discussion together with Dr. Beverly Ho of the Department of Health and Attorney Sofia Monica San Luis of Margin Law Incorporated, both expert in their respective fields. I also thank Associate Professor Agustin Arcinas of the University of the Philippines for accepting our invitation to serve as a guest moderator. Let me also thank the APPC Technical Committee composed of our PIDS, PIDS Research Fellows, namely Dr. Val Olep, Dr. Sunny Domingo, and Dr. Christina Ipicha, who developed this year's theme and concept paper guided by the Vice President uh, Marifi Ballesteros. And to the PIDS DPRN team uh, led by Dr. Silas Yar, our MC, Thank you for the preparations for the yearly uh, DPRM celebration. Let me also thank other committees at the PIDS led by Director Rini Aizai and Director Jemilin Hamias uh, Garcia and their staff for the contribution toward a smooth scanback of this year's DPRM and the 45th founding anniversary of PIDS, which we will celebrate on September 26. On behalf of PIDS, I also wish to extend our gratitude to the Banco Central ng Filipinas or BSP for its constant support to PIDS in the conduct of the APPC. BSP's generous assistance has allowed us to tap brilliant minds from different parts of the world to share their expertise and wisdom in our yearly public policy conference. Let me also take this opportunity to acknowledge the continued support and cooperation of the permanent partners of the PRM Steering Committee, composed of the National Economic and Development Authority, Civil Service Commission, Philippine Information Agency, DSP, Department of Interior and Local Government, Presidential Management Staff, Department of Budget and Management, the Senate Economic Planning Office, the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department. We also thank the Climate Change Commission, Department of Health, and Department of Education for accepting our invitation to be part of this year's DPRM Steering Committee. To my fellow civil servants, Let's also greet each other at a happy Civil Service Month as the observance of the DPRM and the Civil Service Month coincide every September. Before I end, let me stress two points. First, we need a comprehensive and holistic approach to addressing the inequalities and iniquities that disproportionately affect our marginal, marginalized and vulnerable sectors. And second, we all have a role to play in promoting social justice. We can start in our homes, offices and communities. In closing, I invite you to watch this video which sums up the message of this year's DPRM and DPPC team. Thank you and good day. China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. More than 3 billion people in almost 70 countries and territories have been asked to stay at home. The COVID-19 pandemic challenged the whole world. No matter one's age or nationality, it affected everyone. However, the impact of COVID-19 was not the same for all. The least advantaged sectors such as the poor, the less educated, the elderly, persons with disabilities, and indigenous peoples bore much of the brunt. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted and exacerbated deep-seated economic, social, and political inequalities and cultural inequities. As we traverse the road to recovery, it is crucial to address these inequalities to strengthen the resilience of vulnerable and marginalized groups to future shocks and ensure that no one is left behind as we move forward from this pandemic. 
Thus, this September, through the observance of the Development Policy Research Month, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, and its partner institutions call on our leaders and policymakers to make social justice the front and center of the post-pandemic recovery plan to accelerate the country's recovery from COVID-19 and prepare for future shocks. In the Philippines, the 1987 Constitution frames the promotion of social justice as a commitment to create equitable economic opportunities. It envisions a nation where all members of society enjoy the same basic rights, liberties, opportunities, and protection. Social justice is also the bedrock of many international declarations in which the Philippines is a signatory, such as the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Copenhagen Declaration, and the UN Millennium Declaration. It is also enshrined in the country's development blueprints, the Philippine Development Plan, or PDP, and the Ambition Natin 2040. So the annual public policy conference which is the main and culminating activity of the DPRM, we encourage our policymakers, the private sector, research and academic institutions, and civil society to work together in reducing and removing the socioeconomic and political inequalities and cultural inequities that divide us. Applying social justice in our policies, plans, and programs should be premised on a holistic approach that sees the organic and functional interrelationship between and among the different sectors of society. We need to recognize that the inequalities and inequities experienced by our vulnerable and marginalized countrymen affect the whole of society as this hamper the attainment of broad-based, inclusive, and sustainable development. Certain areas are in dire need of reforms using a social justice perspective Foremost is education. Policymakers and education providers must design modes of education delivery that are sensitive to the needs of learners, especially those from low-income households, students, regardless of economic status, gender, location, disability, and ethnicity, must have access to quality education. Given the importance of Information and Communications Technology, or ICT, in delivering education and accessing information, the digital divide must be addressed to ensure that everyone has equal access to learning opportunities and digital resources. To protect subsistence and temporary workers from sudden and extended job disruptions, there is a need to improve the design, targeting, and implementation of social protection programs. Likewise, we need a progressive budgeting process that pushes resources to people and places that need them the most. We must also ensure that our public health services are affordable and accessible, especially to vulnerable and marginalized sectors. Policy makers should bet for increased investments in health programs that directly address the needs of the population. It is time for our health care system to adopt a life cycle approach by making quality health care services affordable and accessible to all from birth to old age. Also, we need to protect communities that often endure the damage caused by environmental destruction and climate change. We must avoid activities that harm the environment, violate human rights, and endanger the well-being of vulnerable groups, including cultural minorities. We must ensure that no infrastructure, housing, or development project jeopardizes the health safety, and welfare of communities. Thus, assessing the potential impact of proposed projects is crucial to reduce the likelihood of unintended consequences. Lastly, we must increase the participation of the vulnerable and marginalized sectors in policy discourse and decision-making and make sure their voices are heard. 
This can be done by strengthening government civil society engagements and intensifying the use of bottom-up approaches. The pursuit of social justice is not easy. It is a long and complex process. But through our united effort and shared responsibility, we can have a society where the country's resources and the fruits of economic growth are equitably shared, where everyone is living with dignity and has access to essential services, where the rights of the poor and vulnerable are upheld, and where the environment is nurtured and protected. For more details about this year's DPRM celebration, including the annual Public Policy Conference, visit the PIDS and DPRM websites and follow us on Facebook. It is my honor to thank you very much, Dr. Orbeta. It is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Arsenio Balisakan, Secretary of Social Economic Planning at the National Economic and Development Authority. He is also the chairperson of the PIDS Board of Trustees. Secretary Balisakan is an economist with extensive development policy, governance, and administration experience which he acquired from over 35 years of professional work. He served as a professor of economics at the University of the Philippines for three decades. Before his current post as socioeconomic planning secretary, he served the same capacity from 2012 to 2016, and later as the inaugural, inaugural chairperson of the Philippine Competition Commission from 2016 to 2022. Before his appointment in the Philippine cabinet in 2012, he served as Dean of the University of the Philippines School of Economics, Director of the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, and Under Secretary for Policy and Planning of the Department of Agriculture. He is a member of the National Academy of Science and Technology since 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, let us listen to the keynote message of Secretary Balisaka. PIDS President Aniceto Orbeta Jr., University of Chicago Professor James Heckman, UP Professor Emeritus and National Scientist Raul Pavelia, SWS Chair Emeritus and NASDAQ Academician Mahar Mangahas, Imagine Law Executive Director and Co-Founder Attorney Sofia Monica San Luis, Department of Health OIC Undersecretary Beverly Lorraine Ho, Fellow Civil Servants, officials from different academic and research institutions, the business community, civil society, and the international development commu community. Good morning. I congratulate the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for choosing a highly relevant theme for this year's observance of the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM. Compared to other countries that were struck by the COVID-19 pandemic, the Philippines' performance, as recently reported, shows a mixed bag of good and bad news. Let me start with good news reflected by data from the Philippine Statistics Authority. In the first semester of 2022, the country achieved a 7.8% growth in its real gross domestic product or GDP, which was faster compared to major neighboring countries in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. In the second quarter alone, the real GDP growth was at 7.4%. This positive outcome, which has been attributed to the relaxation of quarantine restrictions and increased vaccine rollout, included an expansion of sectors on the supply side, such as the services sector at 9.1%, in the industry sector at 6.3%. A similarly encouraging situation can be seen in the employment sector. There was an improvement in the un unemployment rate from 7.2% in July 2021 to 5.2% in July 2022, when employment 
totaled about 47.4 million. And their employment rates also improved from 21.0% in July 2021 to 13.8% in July 2022. I could stop here and end the speech on this upbeat note. But as a researcher and social scientist myself, I must objective, objectively present the less pleasant developments in our economy. Looking closely, some sectors of the economy have lagged and inflation has accelerated. For instance, in the second quarter of 2022, the agriculture, forestry, and fishing sector grew at only 0.2%. The inflation rate also accelerated from 5.4% in May 2022 to 6.1% in June 2022, largely driven by an increase in food inflation from 5.2 to 6.4 percent. In July 2022, inflation rose further to 6.4 percent, but slightly slowed down to 6.3 percent in August. More importantly, poverty has risen. Poverty increased from 16.7 percent in 2018 to 18.1 percent in 2021. This is equivalent to around 2.3 million additional Filipinos being pushed into poverty compared to 2018. The unprecedented scale of the health and economic crisis coupled with policy response challenges caused such an increase. Socioeconomic scarring in health and education made worse by the poor limited access to adequate health care as well as tools for remote learning is expected to linger if it is not remedied. This is compounded by the poor vulnerability to environmental shocks and the lack of social protection that can caution the impact of such shocks. These are development concerns that are at the center of this year's DPRM theme, which will be tackled in more detail in the annual public policy conference webinar or webinar series, which begins today. These challenges need to be addressed holistically, both in the short term and in the medium term. In consultation and collaboration with various sectors, the National Economic and Development Authority has begun drafting the 2023 to 2028 Philippine Development Plan, which is framed by the eight-point socioeconomic agenda. Briefly, the goal we want to achieve for this period is to reinvigorate poverty reduction and job creation by guiding the economy toward a high growth path and develop a resilient, inclusive, and prosperous society. How do we get there? In the near term, we must protect the purchasing power of families, mitigate the socioeconomic scarring caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, reduce the vulnerability of the poor and marginalized sectors, all while ensuring sound macroeconomic fundamentals through efficient government processes. In the medium term, we aim to focus on job creation and rapid poverty reduction by addressing the most binding constraints to greater economic dynamism, such as our infrastructure, regulatory environment, and competition landscape, as well as public order and safety, peace, and security. With this agenda, the government aims to lower poverty to a single digit level by 2028, a lofty but achievable goal. In the near term, the government is working on the full reopening of the economy. Current efforts involving the health sector include the DOH campaign, Pinas Lakas, which seeks to increase vaccination rates across the country. The results have pushed to establish the Centers for Disease Control and Virology Institute of the Philippines to help strengthen the health system. Additionally, digital transformation of government processes is underway to facilitate and improve social protection. The PSA and the Banco Central ng Pilipinas are in close coordination to hasten the rollout of the national ID to reach a target of 92 million national IDs released by 2023. In the education sector, face-to-face -face education is already being done and is expected to be fully implemented. 
This, in particular, is expected to prevent future productivity losses and to boost commercial activities, especially of MSMEs. Additional investments are being made in the social protection of vulnerable segments of the population and in enhancing human capital development. For example, efforts to improve our agricultural productivity and assist farmers aim to lower input costs, develop new farming technologies, extend financial assistance, and strengthen the agricultural value chain. Fuel discounts are also being given to farmers and fisher folk. Other fuel-related activities include the targeted transfer program, libre ang sakay program, and fuel subsidies under the Pantawid Pasada program for tricycle drivers. Alternative modes of transportation are also being eyed for sustainable transportation. Additionally, the government is emphasizing the need to enhance skills, to increase employability, and encourage alternative work arrangements when this proved to be effective and productivity enhancing. Of course, the government alone cannot sustainably and simply provide assistance and improve economic welfare. Its efforts must be complemented by the resources, expertise, and capacities of the private sector. The socio-economic agenda emphasizes increased private sector participation in infrastructure investments, especially through public-private partnerships. Infrastructure for water, telecommunications, transportation, logistics, and energy will be upgraded to provide a conducive environment for more investments in manufacturing, ITBPOs, tourism, and the creative industry. We will also see a greater role for the private sector in providing programs for skills development so that there will be no skills jobs mismatch and so that our labor force be becomes more competitive relative to our peers in the region. In addition, the government commits itself to ensuring a competitive playing field and a regulatory environment conducive to innovation from the private sector as the country's engine of growth. There's no magic wand for solving the economic problems of the Philippines. However, addressing the socioeconomic inequities and improving access to opportunities as to expand our economic pie is a key policy trust that can allow us to meet our ambitious goals. This means leaving no one behind. Government programs and policies must be aligned so as to empower the vulnerable and marginalized groups and uplift their well-being and quality of life. We at NEDA commit to this objective by enhancing national planning and monitoring and ensuring that our policies and programs are based on careful study, anchored on data, and a, st and a strong appreciation for rigorous policy research. Thank you, and I wish you a productive discussion and a successful APPC. Congratulations once again, and good morning to all. Thank you very much, Secretary Balisapan. At this point, let us have a photo opportunity with our speakers and panelists. May I request all concerned to turn on your videos. Uh, we will be assisted by Thea, our platform host. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. So this concludes the opening program of the 8th Annual Public Policy Conference. We will now proceed to the first webinar on the topic, the concept of social justice in the 21st century. This webinar will be facilitated by our guest moderator, Dr. Agustin Arsenas, Associate Professor of Economics and Development Studies at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and Los Banos. 
Before joining the University of the Philippines 17 years ago, he worked as an environmental economist at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., and as a visiting assistant professor at Michigan State University. Dr. Arsenas, over to you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. It truly is an honor to be here, and I'm uh, very grateful to PIDS for inviting me to be part of this uh, very exciting and, and really looking forward uh, webinar. Uh, before we proceed, there are just a few things that I'd like to mention. First is that uh, the flow of the webinar will be uh, Professor Heckman will be giving a lecture. And uh, after his lecture, there will be a short period of time wherein people can ask uh, just a few few questions because he has to leave at 1030 or maybe comment. I think that uh, I think uh, Dr. Maga has, has I would like to address uh, Dr. Heckman uh, later on. Uh, but that's only a short period of time, as I said, because he has to go at, at 1030. And uh, for everyone's information, this is a moderated discussion. So if you have any questions for those that are here in the, uh, as, as uh, panelists, you can uh, type your questions in the Q&A box. And for those that are watching this on Facebook Live, you can uh, type your questions on the comment section. All right, thank you so much. And I just want to say that I was very impressed with the video that the ideas put together. I thought it was insightful. It was some, something I think that uh, government people that are attending today uh, should take heed of because they already outlined very useful insights I think that can be used for policy. Thank you. Um, so moving on, because we have very little time, let me introduce to you our very distinguished speaker, uh, Professor James J. Heckman is the Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, where he directs the Center for the Economics of Human Development, a research center dedicated to rigorous empirical research on the economic foundations of life cycle inequality. Dr. Heckman has devoted his professional life to understanding important social and economic issues, including how best to reduce inequality and promote opportunity for all. His current research at CEHV includes analyzing the impacts of early childhood programs around the world by studying the immediate and long-term impacts of interventions, uh, including the impacts on midlife, on health, and on other family members. Uh, in 2000, uh, Professor Heckman won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on the microeconometrics of diversity and heterogeneity and for establishing a causal basis for public policy evaluation. He has received numerous other awards for his work, including the John Bates Clark Medal in 1983, the Gold Medal of the President of the Italian Republic in 2008, the Frisch Medal from the Econom Econometric Society in 2014 for the most outstanding paper in applied economics published in Econometrica in the previous five years, and the Dan David Prize in 2016. He consistently ranks as one of the most cited economists in the world, as report reported by WIPEC. Heckman, Professor Heckman has a BA in mathematics from Colorado College and an MA and PhD in economics from Princeton University. He has been at the University of uh, Chicago since 1973. And on a personal note, he went to school with one of our panelists, Dr. Mahar Mangahas. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to present to you our distinguished lecturer for today, Professor James J. Heckman. Okay, here. Oh, wait. I don't know.
I, I'm now you can hear me, correct? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Professor. Okay, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. And as you heard already, Mahara and I go back a number of years. So it's really an honor and a pleasure to be associated uh, with him in this conference and to hear his comments and uh, hear his ideas. I've uh, followed his work over the last 50, 60 years, and it's always excellent work. Today, I know that the session is devoted to notion of social policy designed to improve uh, social uh, inclusion and to promote uh, the structure of, uh, of uh, diversity and uh, human development and human opportunity. And this is a topic I've been working on for many years now in, in, at the Center for the Economics of Human Development and even before. This is part of the economics department of the University of Chicago, but it's a subset that carries on a tradition that's very old at the University of Chicago, the tradition on the economics of human capital. So today I wanna to talk about one strategy for human development and society develop, societal development. And that is promoting skills to promote successful lives. And so I've been working on this topic for a long time, and I just want to summarize some lessons. And I, I continue to work on this. And today I will talk about some work that I'm currently doing in China and also in Ireland that is very much in the spirit. But if you think about the issues of approaching poverty and social immobility, the strategy that's frequently developed and applied throughout the world is the notion of alms to the poor. The current Pope, for example, has really stressed this as a central theme of his papacy, but he's hardly alone. And that is the idea of using the tax and transfer system to redistribute income to the poor. And this is the policy that's used a lot in the Western welfare states in Western Europe in particular. In the United States, going back to the 1960s, the U.S. Great Society programs tried this policy as well. And it's part of a, it was part of a broader strategy to end poverty and to promote uh, intergenerational social mobility. And the goal was to essentially end poverty in what appears to be an obvious way, which is to transfer resources, in particular cash, and cash programs, food and resources, directly to the poor. It also had a shotgun skills approach. By that, I mean, it had a notion of trying to help everybody. And I mean everybody, from the very poor, old people, from the very young, poor people who are trying to develop and emerge into the society at large. And the policy that emerged at that time, this is some 60 years ago or so, was to invest in all stages of the life cycle. So the war on poverty, ended up somewhat with unpleasant circumstances that then had to be remedied in later policy years in the 1990s and early 2000s in the United States. And I'm gonna draw primarily on European and uh, United States uh, uh, history, although I will talk about some work I'm doing in China as well. So what happened was in, in a trying to end poverty, it ended up subsidizing this war on poverty subsidizing poverty enclaves. And its, its strategy was to detach the poor from society, to isolate them in some sense. And if we look, for example, at what the success of this was, the recent work done by Hartley and Ziliak at the University of Kentucky talks about whether or not the war on poverty had a real effect of reducing the intergenerational correlation of welfare participation. And what actually happened, as you can see from this graph, going back to 1974, when the data first started being collected, is that if anything, the, the correlation in which we look at the dependence of a person raised in poverty and, and their children, a person in poverty and their children, how much correlation there was, if anything, the dependence increased over time and it didn't decrease as was initially hoped. And, and this is a major, and this, this graph has actually been recently updated. I didn't get a chance to update it, but it's a very 
persistent and negative story in some sense, that instead of ending poverty and promoting social mobility, we seem to be keeping alive the link between those raised in poverty and uh, their, their family circumstances when young and their own circumstances as adults. So many of the policies that were approved initially had very strongly regressive components. And this turned out to be because people didn't understand the full disincentive effects of poverty programs. There were very heavy implicit taxes on the working poor. There were penalties for marriage. There were, there were many subsidies that were unintended, I think, initially, that discouraged people from working, and it actually promoted uh, single family homes, which then created poverty for the parents, for the single parent leaving, leading the home. So what do we do? What happened after the war on poverty? Well, the United States and other countries learned from this. And there've been a number of similar reforms in Denmark, where I'm working, doing a lot of active work, but in Britain and in other countries around uh, Western Europe. And so what it did was that people began, and American social policy has shifted from eliminating taxes on the earnings of the poor. So that originally there was a disincentive to work. So that if somebody earned above a certain threshold, they were taxed at rates that were close to 100%. That's been eliminated. And there's a much stronger incentive now to, uh, to promote work. Robert Moffat at Johns Hopkins University and Bruce Meyer here at the University of Chicago have really documented how this policy has changed. And there's been some stick scaling back in the sense of disincentives so that working poor in some recent policy changes. But generally, America now has a progressive tax and transfer policy, which means that it's trying to encourage people to work and it does subsidize the, uh, the poor in a way that it wasn't doing 40 or 50 years ago. And it subsidizes the working poor to work, to participate in other words, in the larger society. But there's still an unfocused skills policy that characterizes the country. Now, an effective way to alleviate poverty and to enhance social mobility is to build skills. So instead of, you know, there's a famous saying, I, mean, I don't know what the, the, the status of this is in the, in the Philippines, but I think it's worldwide, that you can give a man a fish and you'll satisfy his needs for the day. You can teach a man to fish and he will be succeeded, he will succeed the rest of his life. That's a versions of that wisdom around the world. And literally the strategies that have been pursued, I think successfully, build skills. And they recognize the importance of skills in the economy. And we know that as modern economies emerge, as new technologies appear, skill policy is really extraordinarily uh, important and building skills very, very important. So if we see some of the newest work on skill bias, technical change, and on the way of automation, and technology are changing the workplace all around the world, we know that more skilled people are the ones better able, not only to benefit from those technologies, but to adapt to change. A recurrent theme of this land of work is to understand how people can react to the very substantial changes in trade, technology, and world uh, patterns of, uh, of, of commerce. But to create a focused skill enhancement policy, we need to draw on some knowledge, recent knowledge about the dynamics of life cycle skill formation. We know that skills are major determinants of flourishing lives. And if we wanna promote inclusion and social mobility, we need to foster skills. It's, a, it's an effective policy. And when it's been tried and successfully implemented, it's had a beneficial effect on all involved, the society at large, the individuals who gain the skills and the larger society around them in various ways. And it builds successful lives. A skilled workforce is also flexible and adaptable. And this is very important because as technology changes and as we get into new trading patterns in the world, it becomes increasingly important to be able to adapt to that change. There's also a sense in which we can think about building skills is creating an autonomous individual, a person who has dignity, agency, and engagement in society, 
This doesn't mean a necessarily selfish person, but it means a person able to stand on their own two feet and able to help others around them, and therefore to, you know, to expand the whole level of society. So I want to argue today that we need to think about this in a somewhat different way than you'll see developed in many international agencies and many well-meaning organizations, even NGOs and other groups around the world. So how should we address these problems? And this is a very important point. We've come to understand the origin of many social problems. Now, as has already been introduced, there are aspects of macroeconomic policy, there are macro issues about changing the incentives, facing workers and firms uh, to make them more likely to benefit from their individual efforts, whether it's building a company, acquiring a skill and the like. But I think we also need to think about how we can make people stronger, more robust, more able to benefit from the modern world. And I think that what we need to understand is if you look at current policy discussions, and this is certainly true in my country, I don't know the Philippines so well, but I would imagine it's true there, that they focus on one problem at a time and they decide to address that one problem. So it's like we have a problem and we solve it. So for example, for fragmented solutions, we have things like uh, for employment, we increase jobs, we have tax breaks. For crime, we increase the police force and crack down on criminals. For health, we have better medical facilities. For teenage pregnancy, we conduct pregnancy prevention programs. And then as I already mentioned, to reduce inequality, prevent, give cash transfers and promote housing. To promote skills, focus on schooling and schooling quality especially college going. So when people think about skills, they almost immediately think about schools. Now, I'm not saying any of these ideas are wrong, but what I suggest is that undergirding these problems and providing a base for tackling all these problems, I think there's a better and more effective way. Fragmented solutions are often not the most effective ones. The problems, these problems and their causes are often highly interrelated. And so I'm asking you today to rethink public policy. Now, there's a statement again. I don't know the, the version of this in the Philippine and Tagalog, but I do know that there's a statement that says that only the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You understand what I mean? When a problem arises, we tackle it. So the question really becomes, should we wait for problems to appear and then tackle it? There's some merit in that. If we're solving all kinds of problems that aren't there, why waste resources doing it? I think it really depends. Persons who are in trouble, the persons causing problems like crime and ill health and so forth, are often very well identified and even well identified early on. And so for this class of problems, and I'll show you how broad it is, targeting early life risks seems to be an important way to at least avoid those problems or to ameliorate them. So here's an example from the, this is all New Zealand data. And they follow these people into their mid-40s. So they look at a group of about 22% of the people. I'll tell you what they are like. They're generally disadvantaged people who can be easily screened in their early childhood years. And in New Zealand, they account for like 66% of all social welfare cases, 77% of fatherless children, 54% uh, of smoking, 40% of obesity, and uh, 
81% of the crime. That's that's the rough approximation to the Pareto principle. And what it seems then is that we can more effectively than we used to think target who which populations are at risk and which ones we can benefit. And on the other hand, there's about 30% that seem to be very much more advantaged. And they never participate in these groups, at least through the mid 40s. Not any of the crime, very little social welfare, very little in terms of smoking, obesity, and the like. So that this populations become segmented and predictable in a way that social policy can draw on them and actually help uh, tackle social problems. So what do we know? So if we look at individuals in the relatively early ages, three, five, seven, we can look at measures of IQ, self-control, socioeconomic status, and maltreatment in the family. And those turn out to be the factors that produce that low risk 30% that I mentioned before. And those people short in self-control, those people living in, in a very poor socioeconomic environments and with child maltreatment, those are the ones who are actually at risk. So what I think is what we should do is move beyond the notion of skill enhancement and social policy to move beyond school. And even if we want to bolster school, we have to recognize that schools are most effective if children come into those schools and their parents highly motivated and really able to learn and take advantage of what the schools offer. So I think the focus on schools misses something very fundamental. And that's the early years of a child's life, especially the role of a family in creating these gaps. Schools are important, but schools alone can't close the gaps. We need to understand skills that are life relevant. So what we've really come to understand, there used to be this notion of PISA. I mean, many countries are still hung up on PISA. It may surprise many people that in fact, even PISA and the PISA tests now have been broadened to include items more than just standard achievement tests, more than just PISA tests as typically you know, for example, in Shanghai, they're very happy that they lead the world in terms of PISA scores. But yet, PISA itself has come to understand that we need to have a broader array of skills, cognitive, social, and emotional skills to enhance the capacities of persons. And I think that is what the modern understanding shows. And I'll show you what we've come to understand. And I've, I've played a role in this and many others as well economists working together with social scientists, for example, sociologists, as well as with psychologists and people in schools of education have come to understand that cognitive ability measured by IQ, it's important. But there are a number of other skills, motivation, the ability to show up on time, sociability, self-regulation, self-esteem, the ability to defer gratification. All of these are very, very important. And we've come to recognize them. And in fact, new PISA tests are being given that exactly are designed to measure these social and emotional skills to better guide educational policy going forward. And one thing that surprises many people, at least with US data, if you look at lifetime earnings, the present value of discounted earnings, what we find is that IQ alone explains at most four to 5% of the variability in lifetime earnings. And what we've come to understand is that if we take this vector of skills, cognitive and social and emotional skills, they can help us reduce, they help lead to reduce crime, they help promote higher earnings, they promote better health, greater civic participation, less teenage pregnancy, they promote social trust, greater trust in human agency. So it builds the skills and the dignity of the larger population, it gives people the capacity to control their own lives and help the lives of those in their families and those they value. And I think these skills as a vector are the principal outputs. And so I think we should move beyond just thinking about scores on PISA tests and scores on achievement tests, even though there's a huge emphasis in many, many literatures, many education. So the question is, how are these skills produced? Schools are major producers. 
But I'm never going to say that schools are unimportant. They're very important. Education is probably one of the single most important factors after the family. But the family plays in a major role that frequently gets neglected. Skill formation starts very early. It starts in the womb. As we've understood the physiology and the uh, uh, developmental psychology of child development, we know that early life conditions affect uh, child, child skill development long before children enter formal school. So here's something taken from American data. But this has been replicated in China, rural China now. It's been replicated in the country of Colombia in South America. It's been replicated in Brazil and of course in Western Europe, in Ireland and Britain and other places. And this graph is very, very important. It's very important, and this is just achievement scores now. It's what I said not to focus on solely, but it's something that is so salient that at least we can start here. So if you look at the gaps in achievement scores at age 18, and you look at the gaps by the mother's education, which is another measure of family status, what you see is substantial gaps. These are scores on achievement tests. So these are standardized scores, where you take a score, divide by the standard deviation and come up with a, what some people call a Z-score. And you can see real gaps at age 18. But if you follow these curves back to age three, which is the first time we can reliably measure these kinds of things, that we see most of those gaps are there. They're certainly there by age five, and they're actually there even at age three. So these gaps start much earlier. And one thing that's interesting is that in this particular measure of achievement, I don't want to go to the wall saying this is the right measure, the real controversy about what the proper measure is, and I've written a lot on that, but I'm not going to talk about that today. What we see is that more or less the schools, unequal as they are, these are all American data, are not exactly enlarging or shrinking this business between the most advantaged, the most educated mothers, and the least educated mothers. And this, I think, is very important. So what we've come is to understand that the wisdom of investing more in prevention and less in remediation, at least in the case of creating skills, and those skills themselves will translate into reduced crime, greater health, more earnings, higher employment, and to create, in other words, a society that's more civically motivated with greater trust, and it creates a civic uh, a benefit for the opportunity. So what I think we need to understand, co-equal, co and maybe I would say with greater priority, is the role of the families and social environments. So not leaving things just to the school, not saying, oh, we're going to produce skills by investing only in school. We should understand that it's parents working with children that make schools effective or not effective. And the family is the cornerstone of skill development. So what have we learned about that? We've learned that encouraging and supporting families is very key to creating successful lives. It's cost-effective and fair, and I'll show you some evidence. Now, in the United States anyway, I don't know the story in the Philippines. I wish I did. I, I didn't really find so much statistics that I could access on the Philippines on these matters. But Philippine demographers and economists can surely uh, fill this in. But what we see is that in the U.S., there's a growing group of people who are never married, single-parent households. There are plenty of divorced families, widow, widowing is going down as mortality improves, separations has been more or less stable over time. But the biggest growth are families that are never married, and where the family, the husband and wife are not together, and in fact, they're usually a single parent, which in the United States anyway, can create and does create serious problems for the mother who heads that family. And we know these home environments matter. This has been replicated in many countries around the world. I'm just showing you the first instance of this study, showing the difference in the environment that young children experience between people at the bottom of the social barrel, what we call welfare in the first bracket, first table here in this, uh, figure, working class, a middle class, and then professions. You look at the children are hearing so many more words 
and professional families. And the style of the in parenting is totally different. It's instead of prohibitions, as frequently happens in very disadvantaged environments, it's much more associated with affirmatives and many fewer prohibitions. So in that sense, there's a structure. And this leads, this just is now still just looking at the structure and saying that kids at age three, at the beginning of my previous graph, those kids are speaking twice as many words, more than twice as many words as children from the welfare families, the children from the professional families. And in the United States anyway, there's been a real trend that more advantage, that this knowledge is getting around. And what we see is huge gaps in expenditures on children versus at the top versus the bottom of the household. And that is a major form of inequality that affects children before they even enter school. So harm environments are associated with child outcomes. Now, if you look at those gaps that I showed before, many people, many conservatives in particular, would argue, oh, that's just genetic. Smart people have smart kids, and they, smart people get highly educated. So all you've told me is there's heritability. And some people would even take that as a case for eugenics, where we might want to essentially modify the, uh, you know, control, suppress the, the people who are disadvantaged or poor. I want to argue that the evidence really is not that strong on purely genetic determination or even major form of genetic determination. What we've really come to understand, and I'll show you some evidence, is that targeted early childhood programs can reduce achievement gaps and produce better child outcomes suggesting that this is some genetic phenomenon, some biological phenomenon that's fixed, but it is a phenomenon that can actually be directly addressed through active social programs that target the disadvantaged. So what I think we've come to learn though, it's more than just working with children. It's also understanding working with parents. We understand the parents are there, and the parents here, I mean broadly, the caregiver in case the mother's away or maybe even dead. In rural China, I'm working with a group of families where the parents have actually migrated from the West to the East to get ma manufacturing jobs. And so the, what's left behind is the grandmother. So whoever the caretaker is, they play a major role in shaping the skills of the child. But what we've come to understand and child development experts have understood this, but economists have been slow to come to the realization that it's a parent-child interactions or a crucial form of investment. So let me give you some idea about why I don't think genetics is much of the story and give you an idea of what can be done. I'm gonna first of all talk about two very well-known programs in the United States. One is the Perry Preschool Program. The Perry Preschool Program targeted children ages three to four in a suburb of Detroit uh, called Ypsilanti, Michigan, just west of Detroit. And uh, it was primarily African-American children, very poor. And it was two hours a day for this during the course of the school year. There was another program called Abecedarian, which was done in North Carolina. And that was more intensive it started earlier and it went a little later. It's eight hours per day. So it's a more intensive program. But effectively, much of the teaching and learning component is the same. Now, Perry Preschool and many of these programs have a component to them. I'll show you one crucial component, but let me... So I want to give you uh, some idea of what, how these programs have actually operated. So here's an example. Here's an example of how IQ, as measured in the early age, went up. The Perry program was evaluated by a randomized controlled trial. I don't know how much JPAL has taken over the discussion in, uh, in the Philippines, but I do know that randomized trials are really a, a feature of much modern social policy evaluation. And I'll give you results on randomized trial. So these children who are starting at age three were basically all subnormal IQ, they're age 80 or so. And one thing that happens, we followed these kids. These kids were start, this program started in the early 60s. We've now followed these children until they're in the mid 50s. So I'll give you some idea of what's going on. 
So what happened was in the early years of the program, the children got higher IQs and the parents and the control group children did not. And so early people were saying, oh, this is a great miracle, we boosted IQ. But then at age 10, the treatment and control groups caught up. And this led to a whole discussion. It led to a discussion saying that we can't do anything about, Arthur Jensen wrote these papers that were suggesting that we couldn't do anything about disadvantaged children. No matter how hard we tried, the genes kicked in, and there we were, they couldn't do a damn thing. And that's what got the whole Jensen controversy going. And it translates today into, well, 20 years ago, into a book by Charles Murray called The Bell Curve. And this book became very powerful in its influence in some circles, emphasizing genetic determination. But these studies, and her, certainly Hernstein and Murray, assume that IQ was an important determinant of life outcome. I already told you that IQ explains only about 4 to 5% of the variability in lifetime income. But Perry was not a failure. When we follow these children over the lifetime, we find that kids did better in school, had higher levels of employment, lived healthier and more socially productive lives. And so we look at an annual rate of return following these people now into their mid fifties, we get rates of return of seven to 10% per annum. Per annum, that's a huge return. This is a real return too. And it's after taxes, so it accounts for all the welfare loss that the good public finance economists worry about. And how did it work? It worked primarily through boosting social and emotional skills. It even led to higher achievement test scores, PISA scores. Why? Because kids were more motivated. Even if they had the same IQ, they were actually more highly motivated in school. So achievement tests, which is what Murray and Ernstein actually used, don't measure just pure IQ. They measure effort and the desire to learn. So this lasts over generations. We followed not only the children in the original study, but their children. These people are 55. Most of them have children. We follow their children at least into their mid-20s, uh, early 30s. And if you look at their own children, you see that the children of the original treatment group have children themselves that are more successful in school, they're much less likely to be arrested, they're more likely to have some employment experience and to graduate, so that there are intergenerational effects. So there's a multiplier working through these programs. Now, what do we know about this? What do we know about this? Well, one mechanism that was very important, especially in the American context, is that when children were in this program, when, when the, the, the children of who were in the original program, when they themselves got in their 30s, these people, the blue curve here, the top curve, shows you how much more they were likely to be married and have live in stable families. These are the uh, control, uh, people in the control. So the male participants who were in the program were likely to be in stable marriages. And it's led to successful lives for their own children. The ABC program started even earlier. It improved parenting practices. There was higher educational attainment. But one thing that many people are surprised about is how much these programs actually boosted health. So if you look, for example, we have a paper that we published in Science some eight years ago now. And if you look at the study, you can see that the blood pressure is lower, both diastolic and systolic. The notion of hypertension is lower. The cholesterol is lower. The metabolic syndrome is lower. So what you see is real health benefits. Now, why is that? Hey, wait a minute. That's a program that was early childhood program. How would it operate? Because it promoted the skills that lead to self-control, that promote education, that promote knowledge. And these themselves give the agents to control their own lives in a better, more effective way. And when we look at all the benefits, including the health benefits, what we find is the return on this program is even higher. Real return of 13.7% per annum, very high return. And it led to, if you look at the components, to high rates of return. I won't go into the details because I don't know if they're highly relevant here, 
in, in the Philippines. But what's one of the main mechanisms underlying these programs? What it does, and what we saw as a side benefit, and this wasn't looked at initially, that these programs enrich the home lives of children outside of the child care center. It keeps the parents actively engaged long after the children leave the program. So if we look in the first years between the children, of uh, the parents of the treatment and control group, we can see that the treatment parents, the parents of the treated group, are more likely to be believe in their, their important role in parenting. They're more likely to provide warmth for their children. They're more likely to be actually less authoritarian, to be more loving and caring for their children. And so the essential ingredient, one is, there, so the real question is these programs do lots of different things. And so one of the difficulties in this literature has been focusing on, oh, this program does that, you know, we have a play period, we have home visits, we do this and that. The question is, can we isolate which features are most important? And so what I want to do, and I do in this research, is examine programs that focus attention on only one aspect of child development, but one that turns out to be very well documented. And these are so-called home visiting programs. So I've been working with a group in Jamaica now for a number of years. And Jamaica had its own program, but it's different from these omnibus programs like Perry and ABC. This was a program that was in the Jamaican slums. It was done some 35 years ago now. It targeted stunted children. These programs are about one-tenth to one-twentieth of the cost of the previous program. And what does it do? We followed these kids through age 30 now. And it, it random assignment again, all everything I'm giving you is from random assignment. And so what it did is we found when we follow these children now to age 30, there are long lasting effects on cognitive and social and emotional skills. So if you look, for example, now at age 30, the age 30 results, you can see that the controlled children, the treated children are much more likely to essentially uh, go to college and finish college and, and so forth. And the wages of the treated children are much higher. And we can look at a lot of other dimensions. I won't go into them because I'm running out of time. More recently, I've been taking this program. And the, be the beauty of this program is the following. This program is very robust. In the original Jamaican program, the home visitors were not PhDs. They weren't MAs. They were visitors who were of the same level of education as the mother, often very low level of education in the Jamaican slums. We've taken this to Western China, a province called Gansu, very close to Senchan, very poor area. Now what we do is we find a diversion of the Jamaican program and we look at these kids and we have home visiting. And the purpose of the program is not to put these kids in an expensive center, not to put them into all these different, but what we do is you strip out one component of the program. And this component is basically sending visitors one hour a week, one hour a week now. But it encourages the caretaker. It's targeting the caretaker to talk to children, to make ploy books and the like. In the original Jamaican program, they encouraged the caregivers to take materials from the village dump, something very cheap so that they could actually just do this. And it would be teaching the child, and the caregiver to interact with the child and to, and to realize, to teach the caregiver, the mother, exactly the benefit of having that interaction. And so it's, in the China Reach program, we have a whole set of protocols. I don't have time to go through this, but if we look at standardized achievements for us, now here, I don't have age 30 results, we only have results through age four. So these are early on. But what we find is substantial improvement in language, social, and emotional skills, both in midline and in the end line of this program. And we also see huge impacts on improving the quality of home life. And if you look at the skills that emerge from these programs, you see substantial benefits, whether you look at the density on the left side or the CDFs on the right side. And this is true for social and emotional skills, fine motor skills and the like. 
And I would argue that there's another program like this, which is preparing for life. It's a little bit older now. It's also a randomized trial, but it's similar to a home visiting program. And it's similarly cheap. It's one hour a week. Sometimes, in many cases, one hour uh, every two weeks. And what you see is basically trained mentors, but at the same level as the mothers. So these are not, training the visitors is not a difficult task. And what we can see is you support the child in very low intensity. So the children are getting 51 hours at most over a five-year program, much less intensive and therefore much less expensive. But if you look, for example, at school entry, the treatment children getting very similar idea, the mother learns how to interact with the child, has play materials and so forth, the, the, the treatment children are doing much better in terms of entry level, much better in terms of social and emotional skills, much better able to manage attention, much better able to essentially uh, you know, perform at verbal ability, uh, much less obesity and so forth. So what is the universal feature of these effective programs? Well, child development experts would have said this some 80 years ago. with a Russian uh, mental, Russian developmental psychologist called Vygotsky who talked about this program. And he promoted parenting and he talked about what was called scaffolding. He had an image from some kind of, like a sculptor building a child. You find a child where the child's at and take the child to the next step, but it's gradual. You, you sound out where the child is and you teach the parent how to scaffold. And this promotes parenting, mentoring, and therefore you don't need a lot of time with the child at a center. What you need is a lot of time with the parent working or the mentor or whoever is staying at home is fostering the child and teaching these lessons. So let me just go on to conclude. I guess I'm over time, so I got to stop very shortly. But what we've also come to understand is I don't want to say it all, it's all over at age three or age five or age eight, no such thing. But what we do know is that you build an important skill base earlier and you make later investments so much more productive. If you build, it's like growing a, a tree, it's growing some kind of plant. If you have a very strong root system, a very strong child in terms of motivation and ability, it becomes much easier for the child to learn. And so we know there's a life cycle process there. So we, we know that there's a study here at the University of Chicago, which starts with very disadvantaged children. It mentors those children. So in other words, it's providing this kind of enriched parenting. And if you look at this lottery system, it's, it's mentoring the children. So if you look at age three, four, and five, this is a randomized controlled trial and you're looking at standardized test scores, what you see is huge gains. These are the numbers in bold here by, this is work by my colleague, Rowdenbush, Lisa Rosen, and Hasser. And we can see, for example, how uh, the kids are actually uh, doing much better. So adolescence is also a target of opportunity, but adolescent interventions are far more effective. And let me just uh, make one observation about crime. Terry Moffat, one of these people who mentioned in the Dunedin study earlier, has this very interesting study about the onset of type of criminal trajectory. And this is found to be true around the world. This is more like a biological phenomenon. There's, an early, there's a group that's life persistent aggressive behavior. And this manifests itself starting at age three and four, exactly the age that Terry was targeting, it turns out. And then there's another group where these adolescent aggressive behaviors emerge in the, in the later stage of life, but it's not the same. So early emergence and then adolescence emergence. These are the two types of criminal trajectory. Perry focused on the early year, three to four. And what you see is an age crime curve. This is very well documented that most crime appears among younger people. But what we see is that adolescence crime is much less much less. And so there are two distinct theories. There's life course persistent criminal behavior, which starts early in aggressive behavior and lasts over the whole lifetime. And then there's this adolescence limited behavior, which has a much shorter trajectory. We can target both, but two different types of behavior that we can target. 
And what we find is that if, when you look at adolescents' limited behaviors, that in the Dunedin study, the Dunedin study is just an observational study. It's not an intervention. But what it shows is that, you know, adolescent intervention, people living short lives, uh, short criminal lives, I mean, say that, not short lives, but uh, life course persistent, many more convictions and especially many more violent convictions. And so we know that targeting these times can be very opportune. So at the core of effective mentoring is basically parenting, attachment, interaction. That sounds like a very soft and fuzzy thing for an economist to talk about, but it's not. And it's actually just what, what good schools are doing, what good individualized instruction is doing. And so what we've come to understand in terms of skill and character development is something from physiology, which is the slowly developing prefrontal cortex, which regulates decision-making and judgment, what psychologists call executive function. That can still be developed even in the late adolescence, early 20 years. But the general pattern that emerges is the following. There's an interplay among these different skills, social and emotional skills, health and cognitive skills. They interact. And the theme, the motto, if you will, is that skills beget skills. And when we look at the dynamics of skill formation, we recognize the importance of starting early. And in terms of economics, the term dynamic complementarity is really important. Investing early creates greater receptivity. So think of it as a dynamic process. You build a skill base, then you make an investment later. But if you start investing in an already strong skill base, they can learn new skills. And so learning we know is this dynamic sequential process. And we formalize that, we characterize that through standard dynamic programming methods. I won't go into that today. But it does mean that part of the high return to early childhood investment is precisely because it benefits returns later down the mainstream. So early on, we can invest in the early years, providing nurture to the child, avoiding fetal alcohol syndrome, avoiding a lot of the conflicts that go out there. We know that we can get very high returns. Why? What I mean is it's not that schooling doesn't have a high return. That's not the way to read this graph. But it's simply saying that if I put one unit of value, so here I'm using reals, but you know this is uh, some some measure, some returns to a real value investment. What we find is that programs targeted towards the earliest years have this benefit precisely because they have lasting benefits in building the capital stock, the human capital stock, for learning at later ages. And if we only wait until schooling or dead remedial job training, we're getting very low returns because we let the skill base deteriorate. So what we should be careful, I'm not saying that schooling doesn't matter. I'm not saying job training doesn't matter. We get very high returns to schooling, but for those who have high level of ability and motivation created and formed largely in the early years. So let me just conclude. Uh, what we found, of course, is that it returns to college education are high for the most able and motivated students. So if we look at the U.S., we're getting rates of return of 22% for the most capable and motivated students. So let me summarize. This is only part of the story. And I realize in terms of the, the, the introductory remarks already made in this symposium that there are many other factors at work. Skill, the policies towards regulation, policies towards capital investment, taxation. I'm not saying this is the only thing that would be relevant. But I think if we recognize the life cycle of skill formation, we recognize we can build the skills, the skills that we need, and we do so more effectively at the early age, that we know that these skills matter. They are really huge by family background. They can be addressed by intervention, so there's no genetic determination here. Families are the main producers of skills, not schools. That's really important. And effective schools are supported by effective families. So I think what will really help will be a comprehensive approach to skill formation. So thank you very much. I think I went over a little bit and I look forward to any comments. And I guess Mahar is gonna talk, I'm not sure. I'd be very interested in hearing him. I haven't seen him for a long time. So 
thank you for your attention and uh, I, I look forward to any comments or remarks that you have. Thank you very much, Professor Heckman. I, I know that uh, Professor Malahas would really like to uh, comment uh, and he'd like to have a chance to speak, but oh, I just I'd have like a burning question. Oh, I, I will give him time. I just want, I just have this burning question. That's, I have really so many questions from the audience, but one that I think um, would, you know, would, is, would merit your uh, attention. There is a question about, in the situation in the Philippines, we're in most families. If you're not familiar with how, uh, how families are in the Philippines right now, most uh, families have at least one parent who, who's abroad because right. uh, you know to earn. And so this is a little different from the case in the United States wherein you have you, know, you have both. But both it's very similar living. to the China. It's very similar to what's going on in China. back to their family, the Chinese case is relevant. Okay, so I guess the, the, the question was how, in a, you know, what are your thoughts about how to address uh, skills formation for families that have at least one parent or maybe both parents who are abroad, maybe something that, you know, policymakers in the country could learn from. Uh, what are your thoughts about how to approach, you know, the development intervention as well for families that, that have uh, one, at least one parent who is abroad. So, I mean, how would, uh, what, maybe like some general policy advice uh, that you could share with uh, government, with our government? Well, one thing we found, for example, in the uh, left behind case in China, that many of the caretakers were turning for grandparents. So the parents themselves had eight, nine years of education. China has been very successful in raising the level of the skills of its population. However, it is the case that the grandparents were frequently with three years of schooling, two or three years. They weren't very highly educated. So what we found is when the home visitors interacted with the grandparents, they had very substantial effects because they taught the grandparents lessons that the grandparents had never realized, how powerful their role was in motivating and providing guidance to their own children, uh, grandchildren in this case. And so I think I'm, I'm more than happy to send you a study. I just, uh, just two days ago, I gave a, a paper in, uh, at Johns Hopkins, literally uh, showing this. I'll be more than happy to send it to you. I'm revising it right now. So <laughs> I mean, I revised it again. This, but I'll be happy to do so. And there's a very large body of work, but there's also work, for example, in other countries. There's work uh, also where this issue of absent parenting is real. And that is the work in India, and work Thank in Colombia, and work in, uh, in in Nepal, and work in, in, in Tanzania. So there is a, there's a large body of research that's looking at these class of problems. But the interesting thing about it is, not only is it effective, scientifically it's interesting because what I found in these more complicated, more expensive programs, a recurrent feature of the successful programs we're was missing his insights. <laughs> yeah, no, the parents were really turned on. And parents were providing this warm, nurturing environment. And therefore, you think about it for a second, the parent is there or the grandparent is there. If those lessons can be taught to the child long after the child care worker has left the house, it's only an hour a week, maybe an hour every two weeks, what happens then is you get a constant environment which promotes child development. And we, we've seen it anyway. When we're, the, the program in uh, China is actually on track uh, at the same growth trajectory as what happened in Jamaica. Now, Jamaica, these kids are age 30. I can send you, we have a new program. I showed you some slides on Jamaica and that's been very successful. Most of those parents are not away. They're mostly working in Kingston. So it's not the same. But there are some who have actually repatriated to the United Kingdom and so forth and so on. But in China, you have exactly the structure that uh, that you're talking about. A lot of absent parents. Both Thank parents you so much. Uh, oh, 
I, I'm I'm uh, I'm hoping that the, the the studies you mentioned could be shared. Thank you so much. That, that we no, would I'm happy appreciate to send that. It. We'll send much. these out. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, maybe I can uh, ask uh, Professor Mangahas to comment. Okay. Am I fine already? Yeah. Unmuted. Hello. Am I unmuted? Okay, all right, fine. Hi, Jim. Good Haven't news. seen you in Hi. so long. It's uh, a long time. Yes, it's good yeah, to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you sound, I would say, as uh, passionate about uh, the subject matter as you did so many, many years ago. Uh, <laughs> well, things. Are, this is a very exciting subject. It's skills, yeah, yeah. human skills. You're a Chicago product, so you know <laughs> the importance of yeah. human capital. Yeah. You now, work with Schultz, and yeah. Thank you. Yeah, now now I'll tell you what I'm what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to improve the reputation of Chicago here because people seem to think Chicago economics is all about you know making money, you know, letting this letting the entrepreneurs go free and doing, doing anything they like. That's you know the bad press that our old professor Milton Friedman you know still has, unfortunately, because he's so misunderstood. Now. So I want to point out some things was as to why this is Chicago economics, but this is not that that bad impression that you know the, the ones who don't know what he really was still say. Look, this is still about costs and returns investments, but this is not talking about money, anything valued in terms of money as the return. All right, it's not money. It, uh, it's talking about the uh, uh, almost like the SDGs, because you're talking about the lesser crime, education, and so right. forth, and so forth, and so on. All right, and, and that's right. where right. I in. That's where I mean. I mean all of those all of those uh, kinds of indicators. Right? Uh, furthermore, uh, it's talking about the importance of private sector participation in the research and in the programs. Yes. Look, now you're 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 talking about the research about about these skills, all right? Mm -hmm. Now I don't. This is my impression. I don't think American federal government program <laughs> researchers. I think they sound to me like they're you know uh, came up by private initiative. This Perry thing, this Asabidarius thing, all right? I don't think that's government initiated and and compelled, right? No. And all right, that's that's that to me is the is uh, one a very very main important uh, important fact of what we learned, right? That you've mm -hmm. got to let people go free and don't don't structure them, <laughs> don't force them into a government mode of things, so that it's only the government research that matters and it's only the government programs that matter. I mean, okay, so that's right. where I come in. Okay, I'm competing. <laughs> I'm doing statistics that directly competes with government statistics. Right, and this is what I this is why I'd like to I'd like to focus on. You see that you're dealing here with things that you learned, which came about from private private research institutions, and the and the uh, uh, the the, uh, the programs also from private research institutions. Right, and of course the University of Chicago is private in itself, not a, not a state not a state institution. So it doesn't right. have, it's not cluttered. It's not cluttered, you know, with uh, some great dicta from above that tells people you have to do it this way. No. And, and that's, what I'm, that's what I'm trying to promote. I'm, I'm trying to promote the, the freedom concept, you know, the open up your mind thing, freedom to choose. That's my favorite book. Right? And, mm -hmm. and just to show that uh, this, you know, this leads to great, great discoveries and that that's all we're trying to do. So thank you for showing that, uh, Jim. And uh, I hope I, I didn't see you in 2011 when I was back there, but but uh, I hope, uh, you know, we'll last long enough to come across each other sometime. I hope so. Very good. It's good to see you, though, if only by Zoom. Yeah, but yeah. I completely agree. I completely agree, though, that I mean, what I'm really emphasizing is the role of the family, which is way outside the role of government. And I think it's a mistake to think it has to be at a government center or a particular government curriculum. Look, in many countries, you have very diverse points of view. 
So, for example, there are people who have different religions. They have different politics. Right. I mean, in the U.S., we have many different kinds of schools and so forth. And what that leads to that, but it what the the, the universal is that getting parents involved in a positive way. I'm not saying they should that there's a political truth here that you should educate your children. I'm just saying getting to read, to write, to be responsible for themselves, to be able to self-actualize to show some measure of autonomy and dignity. That's, that I think, I don't know many people who would prefer, maybe in North Korea, they wouldn't care for that. I don't know. <laughs> but but I don't think, uh, short of that, I honestly believe that we, that these are universal values, but they're not. But you're allowing the forces of love and the family. Parents, most parents love their children. So you're empowering the children. You're turning on a, a private incentive and what no greater love I think exists than a parent for the child. So <laughs> if you just engage the family, you've engaged a powerful force and it's not just sending them to school. It's getting them to, to, to boost the kid at school and to work with the kid <laughs> after school. So. Right there. You're right there. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you. Good. Thank you. Very I, I know. Uh, is it, I know, Doctor uh, Professor Heckman, you have to go, but could you indulge us with one this just one last question before you go? Uh, well, I could stay just, a little longer if you want. It's up to you. Okay. It's up your entirely yours. I'm happy to talk a bit more. Great, well, that's excellent. Although we do have a, a set of panelists that, that also uh, sure, will be reacting and talking. Uh, the one question is: uh, In the Philippines, also we have a lot of street children, and these um, do not have, um, you know, the, the benefit or even the, you know. The luxury of having families. What are your thoughts about how to address, or maybe how to, uh, you know, adopt or your uh, the uh, the find or how to use the findings that you have to address uh, children, street children uh, who do not have families? Like maybe just your thoughts. Well, I think what we found repeatedly, and this is for children in the United States, we don't have street children quite that way. But there are a lot of children who are really lost. I mean, their parents may be both in prison or dead or just abandoning them. Uh, but what we found is that even if the family itself is not present, giving them some mentoring and a guidance along the way, usually a stable mentor. There's some work in Germany, some work in the U.S. But giving them some guidance and mentoring, usually a stable figure, is a very powerful source. So you don't really need to have necessarily a standard intact two-parent family, or even one-parent family. But you do need to have some kind of continuity and advice. I think that is really something that we've learned in terms of child development and teaching children how to succeed. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe one last comment from uh, Dr. Fabella before we proceed to uh, the panel, to the panelists. Hi, Professor um, Heckman. Yeah. I have only uh, two questions. Uh, and the first one, I, by the way, I wrote a long uh, commentary uh, on, on, on your uh, talk and your report. But I'm not going to talk about uh, everything there. I will send that. To, that will be available to Professor Heckman as well as to everyone. Uh, oh, let me see it, please. I look forward to it. Participation. But uh, the two questions, because I know you are uh, in hurry, uh, is the this is the following: Why was poverty not persistent among uh, poor immigrants uh, in the uh, immigrant families in the United States? Uh, does the Chinese mothering <laughs> effect uh, something to do with that? And the second question is uh, rather personal. You don't need to answer this. But I was reading your bio, your Nobel bio, uh, and uh, you started uh, grad work, it seems, in University of Chicago, uh, yes, but finished your PhD in Princeton. Yes. Uh, is it too much to ask for the academic requirement that you missed or what you disliked in the University of Chicago so that you had <laughs> really resulted uh, with a PhD from Princeton? Uh, that's all. Thank you. Well, in, the, in terms of the first one, I completely agree. I like the Chinese mother, the, 
the the idea that we know that some of the most successful families in the United States, I mean, look at the families that came to the United States, Vietnamese Chinese after the Vietnam War, after the U.S. failure in Vietnam, uh, many people came with only the shirts on their back. They really had no resources. But what they had was family structure, a life that they really enjoyed, and um, uh, values for education, and values, love for their children. And I think they actually were very, very uh, powerful. And so, for example, if you go to the University of California at Berkeley now, <laughs> if you ever go there, I think they have a quota on Vietnamese Chinese, because otherwise the whole university would consist of children of Vietnamese Chinese. They're so successful, even though their parents were poor. So we know it's not a question of poverty. And this is something that gets lost. It's not a question of giving money. What those families had were values and encouragement and love. And that's really in short supply. I mean, you know, famous economist D.H. Robertson made the remark, although not in this context, but it's relevant, that in economics, uh, love was a very scarce resource. And I think that's true. But parental love may be even scarcer when you think about the economics of education. So I, th I think that's very important. Now, as for me, well, I'm a hard new me, so he can he can speak more about it than I can, I suppose. I had uh, I came from a small liberal arts college, and the school that I went to at that time was quite tough. It was quite aggressive, uh, it seemed to me, and it was um, and it was in a tough area at the time. So I probably wasn't completely grown up. Maybe that's a way. I was younger than most of the people, anyway. So I think Princeton seemed more like my old liberal arts college. I had almost gone to Princeton anyway, and I'd kept in touch with Princeton. So I went there. Now, when I think back, I learned a lot that first year at Chicago, a huge amount. And we can talk. I mean, we had classes with Friedman. He talked about his work that actually had some brilliant ideas about monetary policy and what later became known as the Friedman Phelps critique. Um, and that literally, People would learn about the inflation rate that was being engineered by governments. Harry Johnson, many, many brilliant people. But maybe I just wasn't tough enough. Maybe that's just the fact. I hate to admit that I was a weakling, but I, I was, hardly. So I felt I left, lost something. But I also have been in Chicago now <laughs> for almost 50 years, and I feel I made up for it. I learned a tremendous amount coming back. And uh, the one thing I did learn at Chicago, at Princeton, that I wouldn't have learned at Chicago at the time, was probably much more formal mathematical methods. I, Princeton was very strong in that, and Chicago was less strong on that. They had good people, but less strong. So something lost and something gained. But uh, I certainly benefited from Aha. We kept in touch, and I, I benefited from his work and his ideas. And um, so... You know, Chicago, the difference between Chicago then and Chicago now is such that at then Chicago was relatively easy to get into, but very easy to flunk out. There was a very high failure rate. Uh, now it's relatively hard to get into, but it's not hard to flunk out. Most people pass. So it's a probably less intense environment. The result, we've lost something, I think, in the sense of taking, taking, chances on people who aren't who aren't quite, you know, don't aren't perfect scores on tests and grades and so forth and so on. So I think we've moved away from a strategy that I think at one time was very successful. It was more laissez faire and now less so. I uh, I had this impression uh, I always remember uh, you especially uh, because you seem to have uh, exemplified uh, a false negative for Chicago. <laughs> in other words, uh, <laughs> in other words, they made a mistake on you. But that, no, but I, I, as, I wasn't. I wasn't my, kicked out. I, I just had the. But I found it very demanding. How probably remembers, but the time we were students, there was a race riot in Chicago, and there were there were troops all around at an armory very <laughs> close to campus, and. Uh, it was uh, it was a kind of a, and I I had grown up in a in in Colorado uh, out in western 
out by Denver, and it was a very and went to a small liberal arts school. So our classes at Chicago were much bigger. Now it's different. It's smaller. It's closer to a liberal arts school. So maybe Chicago isn't what it used to be anymore. Maybe not as tough. Uh, I don't know. But there yes. was something like survival of the fittest. So Mahara succeeded, and um, I didn't. And I congratulate him. <laughs> but there's, yes, so there, fortunately, life is such that you can make up uh, for your initial losses. Uh, so I did. Yeah, you did. James, okay. uh, it is said of uh, Ramanujan, the mathematician. Ramanujan, yes. Yes, uh, the, that uh, on his death, uh, his epitaph was written by a little child, I think. Uh -huh. And his, the epitaph read, even his mistakes were brilliant. And in this case, even Chicago's mistake <laughs> was brilliant. Uh, <laughs> that is to assuage my heart. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm so sorry, but uh, we're, uh, we're running out. study uh, here in the Philippines or do research in the Philippines uh, and it's specifically related to this topic because we do have yes. this is a this is a real issue here uh, no, something that no we, need to we have I, I, this versions of these curricula we we want I helped launch this program in China so we went to rural China we set it up uh, we worked with a local uh, demographer local sociologist and economist but uh, we were, we're working. I worked very actively with something called China Development Research Foundation. Lu Mai, you may know, who's in uh, China. It's an advisory group to the Central Committee in China, but it's independent. And uh, we, uh, no, I'm very actively engaged. And we, we almost set up a version of the program in an urban area in Shenzhen, but then COVID came in and we just, oh. everything's been put on hold. But there's still right. plans to go forward and. In, in urban areas as well. So uh, yes, I uh, very much, so, and I think it's adaptive to a country like the Philippines. And that's the point of it, it's cheap. You get very high rates of return and it's cheap because I think it's like you're taking the core idea, which is parental involvement and, and, and developing that and making that strong. And so even if you can't, look, some of these programs are 20 or $30,000 a year per child. This is much cheaper. People, you can engage and local values. So you might have a Muslim area, a Christian area, you might have different religious and secular groups, but there's no reason to get involved in religion or politics. But I think every person on earth wants their children to be successful, engaged, and able to function in the society. So I, that's why I like it. It's cheap. And I, to me, I, I'm doing a whole scholarly study based on the Chinese study where we're looking at the development of skills. And here it's new. We're looking at this week by week development. We've, we've collected very rich data where we see how parent-child interactions, how parent-visitor uh, interactions and, and, and the like are stimulating child development. And not building a school, it's not giving textbooks, it's not training teachers. What it is, it's interacting. It's actually challenging the student. So just think of scaffolding. Think of, uh, think of a famous sculptor <coughs> creating a, a figure and uh, that's what's at work. So yes, I'd be more than happy. We have a group working. Thank you so, Thank you so much. I think uh, many of uh or some of the key policy ma managers and policy makers are here. And uh, I, I'm very certain that they're very glad that uh, you know, you'd be willing to help us. Thank you so much. And on that okay. note, I think we have to end. Uh, any last words, Professor Hugo? No, thank you. It's a great opportunity to my old friend and also to see all of you. I, I hope uh, I can keep in touch. And I someday, I've never visited Manila. I was invited several times. It never worked out. But at some point, oh. uh, the Philippines, of course, is always a place that's very close to Americans. And uh, so uh, uh, it, close in our hearts and close in our history. But uh, I've never been there. So. <laughs>
well, consider this an open invitation to please come visit the country, uh, try the beaches, <laughs> and uh, okay. Professor Mangahas will be here. So it'd be fun to uh, reunite <laughs> and reminisce. <laughs> okay, that would be very right. nice to see you. Okay, thank take you care. so much. Hello, Jim. Thank you very much. Okay. And on that note, I've come to that portion where we uh, have the panelists. We have a distinguished set of uh, panel members that are also going to, that we also have a chance to, to, uh, to address. Uh, let me introduce to you each one of them. Our uh, first is uh, Dr. Raul Fabella, a social scientist, and we a professor emeritus at the University of the Philippines School of Economics. And he holds a position of honorary professor at the Asian Institute of Management. He got his MA Economics from the UP School of Economics and his PhD from Yale University, and is currently a member of the National Academy of Science and Technology. He was elevated to the rank of National Scientist by President Benigno Aquino in 2011. He was a long time, for a very long time, a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Economics. Bro, and has uh, worked on uh, studies and concepts like development for Nigeria, conglopolistic competition, landed poor, the, the debt adjusted real exchange rate, divide by N and others. Okay, that's uh, Professor Fabella. And um, the, our, our next panel member is Professor Mahar Mangahas, a, a, a classmate and friend of uh, Professor Heckman. Uh, should I tell? He was born in 1944. Is the first is a Filipino economist who has done re uh, research in, on rice economics, land reform, poverty, hunger, income inequality, quality of life, governance, and public opinion. Uh, after basic schooling at the Ateneo de Manila, he went to UP and the University of Chicago. He went to UP for his AB and his MA and in 1965 and the University of Chicago in 1970. Professor Manga has taught at UPSE. Uh, teaching economics, of course, and he was a UNICEF social indicators consultant in Malaysia and Indonesia. He was also the vice president for research of the Development Academy of the Philippines, editor of the Philippine Economic Journal, president of the Philippine Economic Society, president of the Marketing and Opinion Research Society of the Philippines, co-founder of the Philippine Agrarian Reform Foundation and the Foundation for Economic Freedom. In 1985, he co-founded the Social Weather Station the Philippines' leading institute in quality of life monitoring, opinion polling, and survey archiving. Uh, he was president up to September of 2021, after which he became the chair emeritus. In uh, 2019, he served the award for the betterment of the human condition and uh, from the International Society for Quality of Life Studies. Uh, the next panel member is uh, Dr. Beverly Lorraine Ho, who is the OIC Undersecretary of the Public Health Services Team and the concurrent director of the Health Promotion Bureau of the Department of Health. As OIC Undersecretary of PHST, she leads the development of standards, policies, and programs in population and individual-based health service. As the HPB director, she leads the implementation of policies and programs that promote the healthy behaviors and support conducive environments for health. She was the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau Director that leads primary care integration of various health programs and the Chief of Research Division of the Health Public Development and Planning Bureau. Beverly is a fellow of the Maurice Greenberg World Fellows Program at the Yale University, uh, the Equity Initiative, and the Atlantic Institute. She holds an MD from the University of the Philippines and an MPH in Health Policy and Management from the Harvard D.H. Chan School of Public Health as a Fulbright Scholar. And uh, our last, but certainly not the least, uh, panel member is uh, Attorney Sofia Monica San Luis, who is a public interest lawyer specializing in public health policy development and advocacy. She is the executive director and co-founder of Imagine Law, a public interest law organization that designs and advocates for policies to help Filipinos live healthy and meaningful lives. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Attorney San Luis is also manages Imagine Law's Imagine Loss Data for Health program, working with low and middle income countries to strengthen their civil registration, vital statistics, and national ID. 
Uh, as a consultant for Quezon City, uh, Attorney San Luis Sofia helped develop landmark legislation on affordable housing and HIV AIDS prevention and control. So that's uh, those are the members of our panel uh, panel for this for this morning. Uh, I think since we've already asked, or Dr. Fabella and uh, Dr. Mangas have already shared their uh, views regarding Professor Heckman's uh, presentation today, maybe that's the opening question for the other two, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ho and Attorney San Luis. What are your thoughts about uh, Professor? Just your general thoughts about Professor he what the, the Professor Heckman's lecture, uh, particularly on uh, social emotional skills develop or uh, the soft skills development. Uh, Professor, I'm uh, sorry, Attorney San Luis or or Dr. Ho, who would like to go first? I guess I'll start. I, I okay. I'm not sure if Dr. Ho is uh, already present, um, but uh, uh, Professor Heckman's uh, talk earlier was really interesting and um, I guess it drives home the point at least in the area of public health where I, I work um, how there are a lot of determinants to health access uh, one of which is education um, and also uh, having social uh, relationships uh, these all affect how all these all affect uh, our health outcomes uh, particularly for education, we know that um, it does not only affect how uh, the the, uh, the child's access to healthcare. Um, education has intergenerational effects. Uh, it doesn't only affect um, your child's access to healthcare. It also affects even survival at the early ages. We know that educated parents tend to um, tend to have uh, surviving children much more than those who are uneducated. So maternal mortality is also higher when uh, we talk about uneducated um, uh, mothers. So it education really has intergenerational effects when it comes to health. Um, I guess I'll, I'll talk more about uh, public health later, but the other thing that's interesting is uh, really having... Uh, having social relationships. And this isn't something that's uh, explored uh, in the Philippines yet, how not having parents impacts healthcare decision-making. Um, children who do not have parents tend to have poor decision-making um, because they, they look to their guardians or look, they look to their um, what we call kasambahay here in the Philippines right. um, right. for their for their health decision making, and so their food uh, would tend to be pre-processed. Um, they tend to eat more fast food because their parents are not there to uh, to prepare their food. So these all have um, health outcomes and uh, impact health impact for children. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ho, I see that Dr. Ho has turned on her camera. What are your thoughts about uh, Dr. Heckman's presentation? Um, thank you, Dr. Arsenas, and good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Attorney Sof, our partner. Um, we're actually very, it was a very enlightening presentation. I guess the, the framing was really on point, and it really speaks to where we in the DOH also want to take the discussion for health moving forward. So typically, um, when everyone talks about DOH, our budget, and what we need to do, um, oftentimes, um, it all gets centered towards um, what happens, the medicines that will be provided, are the hospitals going to be upgraded? But in fact, when you look at data, that only accounts for 20% of a population's health. In fact, um, what accounts for 80% of a population's health um, is a combined factor of uh, what he just said, the socioeconomic factor, health behavior, and physical environment. And so um, what is clear is that uh, beyond working on improving our clinics and our hospitals, the direction is really more around, um, or in addition, working with other sectors to improve physical environments, that that's neighborhoods, that's schools, um, where people actually 
live, interact, um, in their waking hours, no? um, and also modify social and policy environments. So one of the things that we um, work with attorneys, so for example, is elimination of trans fats. You can talk about, um, you know, improving health literacy of people, but when all of the food that's around them, that's available for them to buy, has uh, has trans fat, then it's it's useless. No, even if they can read the labels, then they have no other choice because that's their food environment. Yeah. In the same way as we also know that we have one of the highest um, rates of dental caries in the world, no, more than ninety percent. Um, but that really won't be solved just by giving out toothbrushes and toothpastes to kids no? or, or making sure dental services are available to them. It's really partly a result of a food system that, that, um, that promotes a diet uh, that's quite unhealthy. You know? So I think it's, it's really recognizing this nexus that we in the health sector cannot work in silo. Um, and that we can solve problems like tuberculosis just by massive screening, no? because high-income countries like Germany got out of it because they fixed housing and congestion and sanitation to fix TB, not just by giving out um, drugs um, for TB, for example. So um, very, very enlightened with the presentation and uh, parang reaffirm no? that this direction is uh, the correct way to do things and we hope that this... Um, frame would be further mainstream. Thank you. Oh, totoo naman. Something that, uh, you know, just, just to share. As a, as a professor, I know that uh, uh, they possess, in, in my view, the uh, strong social emotional skills that Dr. Hetman had, uh, had discussed in his presentation. So, I do. I have some anecdotal data that support uh, what he had said, that what he had talked about, and I actually think that uh, that's uh, you know the the way to go uh, for government in terms of uh, designing um, programs uh, specifically for improving the uh, quality of uh, labor, the quality of uh, of uh, human development in general. Okay, uh, I have some a uh, few questions. Again, this is for Dr. Ho. Um, the DOH has recently adopted the life course approach and social determinant of health, or SDH, in the prevention and control of diseases. Could you briefly describe to us the concepts and what do they mean in terms of how we radically change the way our health system is organized, delivered, and financed? Dr. Ho. Yes, thank you, sir. I've briefly um, gone through it a while ago, um, but just to add to it, so 30% um, of that entire 100% nexus of what contributes to the health of the people is um, health behaviors. And when you talk about health behaviors, um, it is premised on people continuously performing uh, or choosing to be healthy, right? whether that's food, that's opting to walk or bike instead of um take um, just public transport, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you talk about health behaviors, you want people to be health literate and health literate isn't just about knowing. No, it's about having the skills and being enabled to do it. Similar to what um, Dr. Heckman just talked about. No, actually health literacy is a skill more than just knowledge as what people would think of it. And so when we say, we want to adopt SDH, social determinants of health approach and life course approach. Um, we are now embarking on more work related to improving neighborhoods. So there's mm -hmm. active transport, um, safe young passageway for people to walk, um, people to bike. Um, it's modifying um, schools. So we have upcoming programs. So we have a pilot this year in last mile schools of DepEd to work on uh, mental health and SRH interventions in schools um, to like top off um, the current DepEd, uh, OK, so DepEd program. So, so it's really moving away from just the typical clinics and hospitals and finding out what specific risk factors are there for that issue. So because our pilot is for grade five to six, then um, the two biggest risk factors for them are mental health and sexual and reproductive health, right? And if we talk about younger kids, 
Um, and then it will likely be sanitation, for example, teaching them hand washing, etc. Um, and just uh, for also the life force based approach is also um, reframing the way we do things, um, which is traditionally very programmatic. We have a TB program, HIV program, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. And we form our guidelines based on that. So we end up having hundreds and thousands of guidelines, which are really impossible to implement on the ground. So th this year we have embarked on really streamlining all of them and making them life course based, meaning we have an omnibus guideline now for child, for adolescent, for adults, for elderly. So everything is in it. And so um, it sort of signals the sector that uh, we're, we're looking at people, not diseases. Right. Yeah. Well, in relation to that, what are the challenges of putting together a comprehensive program like what you said? It's Dr. Heckman also talked about you know, that you can't do like a piecemeal, piecemeal strategy and they have to be comprehensive. Um, what are the challenges of like putting together something that is comprehensive? But you know that you, you integrate all of these uh, components together. I imagine that uh, that must be quite difficult. Uh, but if you could share with us uh, what are the, the things that you've had to contend with putting together something Sorry, sir, the challenges? The challenges of putting something like a comprehensive program because uh, you talked about, you know, that these are the components, these are the things that you'd like to do. Uh, following Dr. Heckman's presentation, he said that, you know, it would be, it be, um, might not work if it's piecemeal, you know, doing things separately and um, might work better if they are, you know, comprehensive and that, that uh, implementation is as such. But I imagine that there are challenges to, to doing just that. So maybe you could share your thoughts about what might be the difficulty in putting something together like that on the ground. Um, definitely, it's getting everyone on the same page. Um, you know, the fable of uh, the big elephant where everyone has their um, <laughs> eyes closed, right? And everyone touching different parts of it. Parang ganun po, no? Um, it's, um, it's reassuring everyone that... Um, to a certain extent, their skills are still um, going to be used for it because there are threats around, will some people be, you know, rendered useless in the context of the bureaucracy just because we shifted um, strategies, right? Um, it's being able to assure um, people particularly also development partners who think that, oh, since you're not talking about TB, you're talking about life course, then maybe it's not anymore a priority of government. So all of these things you have to con um, really be able to balance um, as we move forward towards a more integrated approach. Um, but I guess with, with challenges also comes a lot of hope because um, we have been hearing feedback from the ground also that Kami sa, sa ground, integrated kami. <laughs> Actually, kayo sa national yung mas hindi integrated. No? So parang, um, it's really also people on the ground finally really saying that, okay, you're finally getting your acts together, right? <laughs> and, right. And, and trying to integrate because we have long been telling you that um, at the end of the day, even you have 50 programs at the central office, it's just one or two people at the ground working on it. Right. So right. Um, I guess this gives us hope that maybe we're on the right direction. Um, it's really just uh, we have to recognize that when the rubber hits the road, um, it will be painful, at least in the first. Right. And I guess there is something to be learned from people that are partners or, or the non-government partners who are doing something similar. Some, that's, maybe it's a model that can be followed by government as well. All right, now this question is for uh, Attorney San... Thank you so much, Dr. Ho. Now this question is for Attorney San Luis. I'm uh, hurrying a little bit because we're running out of time. Uh, 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 Attorney San Luis, you're using legal lens to advocate for policies that empower or enable Filipinos to live healthy. Uh, in pushing for these, you have worked with other sectors such as local governments, DNR, etc. In your experience, could you describe the role of other sectors in pushing for health agenda and what are the challenges 
of multi-sectoral collaboration in the Philippines. Something similar to uh, the question with Dr. Hono, again, getting people to work together harmoniously. Yeah, sure. Uh, so obviously, government has the biggest role when it comes to um, health. Uh, because government has that position of power and influence and they can really shape the environment, shape the decisions that are made by people. And that was what um, Yusek Ho was talking about, that uh, their goal now is to create environments in which healthier choices are made. The other sectors that uh, are often neglected when we talk about um, health uh, is the media. Uh, the media is in, in a position where they can inform the public or misinform the public. Um, so the media should be a partner of government in uh, trying to distribute information, not just to those who are on social media, but even those who are in rural areas whose primary mode of um, access to information is still predominantly radio or TV or even their local government. No. Um, the media is also there to elevate uh, specific public health issues in the agenda of government. Um, but if if the media reports everything now as breaking news, the tendency is uh, the important issues are no longer they no longer seem to be important. So it's it's very important. Like for imagine though, we work a lot with the media. We apart from just holding press conferences, we also conduct trainings for the media on how to report on specific public health issues um, so that they can deepen their understanding and deepen their reporting of public health issues like road safety or tobacco control or trans fats um, elimination. Uh, the other uh, sector, of course, is civil society. Imagine law is part of the civil society sector. Um, and apart from our role of informing the public of uh, specific public health issues, we really work closely with government um, in prioritizing certain public health issues, but also in supplying unmet needs. Uh, for instance, uh, during the height of the pandemic, we know of some civil society organizations that uh, took the responsibility of distributing antiretroviral drugs to HIV, uh, people living with HIV, because the government um, didn't have health workers available to distribute those drugs anymore. Um, and so biglang, suddenly they were serving as uh, delivery persons during the pandemic. So civil society is also positioned to meet those unmet needs now, um, apart from partnering with government and providing technical support to government. And then finally, the industry. Um, ideally, the industry is supposed to be to march in step with government when it comes to its sustainability agenda. And also, um, now that they're talking more about corporate social responsibility, but obviously this isn't always the case. So part of the role of civil society is to balance the influence and power of the industry so that the public's um, public's uh, the public's interest is still prioritized by government. Um, over the interests of the industry. Okay, thank you so much. So taking off from that, uh, maybe I can address this question to Professor uh, to Dr. Mangahas uh, regarding the role of information and so and in media in uh, pushing for uh, reform and development. Uh, in your view, uh, what is the uh, or how does uh, let's say uh, the, the work of uh, social weather station, the output of social weather station could be useful in uh, promoting uh, you know, development programs, uh, that those that were described by both Dr. Ho and uh, Attorney San Luis. I mean, what would be, what would be the, what do you think uh, are the essential uh, roles or parts of uh, opinion poll or, or data collection uh, agencies or institutes? I'm thinking about what uh, what would be within our capacity to yes. to add. Right, we could we could add some more questions about the family uh, on the demographics on uh, uh, ages of uh, the various members of the family. And then uh, we 
could ask more items about their about the children, for example. Right. And these are not within our our backgrounders right now. I'm not sure for how long we could afford them. So uh, maybe we'll make a proposal to let's see. Maybe PIDS should should. Uh, <laughs> No, I mean we can they gather. Should, should partner. Maybe we, we can, can gather. Partner. We can gather, but this has to be uh, funded, of course. And uh, we we have our own agenda, you see. And uh, if we're going to expand this particular agenda, we have to think very hard about whether we'll do it on our own resources, or whether we'll have a partner who would like to to go into that. The, the, uh, the type of research described by Jim Heckman is very intensive because, you see, he wants to know about uh, children of young ages and he wants to follow them, you know, after several years and other years. He wants to follow, in fact, from generation to generation. And that means, for example, you have questions and you ask not only about the situation of your respondents, you ask them about their parents and how they were. Uh, that's that's uh, you know not not normal, you might say you know no. in uh, in uh, kind of research and and that needs uh, advocates right to to look into that. For example, uh, the first time I got into this, uh, it was about the religious values of people, and it, this survey had to have questions about the religious situation about the parents, and separately for the father and the mother. You know, so uh, we only were into that because we were committed to being a part of the International Social Survey Program. So we said, well, whatever they call for, we'll have to do. But to do to do something on our own accord, considering that we have many, many other <laughs> things also, right. by the way, which are also very, very quiet, right? Uh, we have to think very, very carefully, see, uh, about that. I think PIDS, by the way, should think very carefully also about uh, where it's going to be getting its data over time, not just once uh, over time, and should uh, and not be restricted only to PSA, the PSA agenda. You know the. You know, the, the Producing the data is very, very important because if you control that, you will control what comes out, you see. So I don't think that the data produced by the PSA should be under the control of the PSA. I only, you know, I think that there are development uh, subject matter that uh, should go into what the PSA produces. Not only once, but over time, you know, like every three years or every five years or something. And these things, these intergenerational things, that Heckman was talking about that that requires a long term data data program, right? right. I'd, I'd like to go into that. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind. All right, but uh, if it's not if it's not uh, with uh, with partners, you know, I'm not going to do it uh, for you know. I'm not I'm not. We're not asking for to make profit, mind you. Okay, right. but we can't we can't subsidize. All right. Right. That right. that's where the advocates come in. That's where the advocates come in. Okay, for example, I I'm thinking personally because I don't control. I'm I'm only a chair a chair emeritus. Okay, I'm not I'm not the president. I'm thinking, for example, of stopping, possibly stopping, our service about the government. Okay, about no about the about about this politician or that politician, and then you will look for it. You know, people will, will say, oh, okay. Then what will happen? Well. I, but that means I would, I must have to have some, some basic, uh, you know, sources also for the other things, you know. And and uh, well, politicians are also good, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's we help each, we help each other, all right. I must have some data that you want, you will, and then you will subscribe, and it's like that, you know. It's a kind kind of a give and take, but it's right. not. It's uh, it's. Uh, what? Well, we, want, we won't be dictated upon. 
<laughs> for right. example, okay, right. unless you have something to to contribute to that, okay. And uh, I like, you know, I, you know what 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 I like about the Heckman thing is these programs, this abecedarian, this Jamaica, this uh, you know Ireland and so forth. Who who brought us about? I'm telling you, it's not their governments. It's some advocates. It's some institutions that said we want to this to look at this, and therefore we're going to we're going to uh, have at least a pilot program, and we're going to do it for a long period, and then we're going to gather data, and then that comes about. That was not, I'm sure, dictated by the federal government or of that or so on. Right? That's what that needs entrepreneurship. That's research entrepreneurship. In fact, that's what I learned the most from Theodore Schultz, you know, in, in Chicago, the research entrepreneur, it's another Nobel guy there, you know. Where does the data come from? Right. Who's going to do that? Where is the PIDS going to get its data? Does it have a does it have a budget for for gathering its own data? It should have, etc. You know, etc. Et right. So right. so you know you know this is not this is my data does not does not grow on trees. Right. All right, you have to you have to nurture it. You have to think about where it's going to come from. Right. You produce it yourself. It's okay. You have your advocacy. You produce it yourself. We also have our own advocacies, and we, as for those, you know, we're we're willing to we're willing to spend for them. So it's not. It, and this is another another Chicago lesson. There's no such thing as a free lunch. All right. <laughs> talaga, talaga, you know, you want you want data. You got to think about who's going to get it, who's going to pay for it, and so forth, and so on. All right. Those advocates will do it. You know, for for free, all right, or they'll they'll raise their, their own money. Is what I mean, they'll raise their own money for it, and and then help you help you for that, and and that's and that's the entrepreneurship part of it. Right. You see, how do you find the resources to do the research? Right. right, not because you're trying to get rich, but because if you don't, if it's not paid for, it will die. Okay, that's all. Well, yeah. well, um, maybe this is something that we could ask uh, Dr. Fabella, given yeah. that this is, you know, that, that this is uh, that you need advocates in order to do this. Is it something that the private sector could maybe engage in? Or if not, how, what are your thoughts about, you know, how to engage them so that they could be one of the advocates and a partner um, in, in this uh, 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 direction of activities? Oh. I have two comments. Uh, first, on the theory side of uh, the intervention, <clears throat> Heckman favors targeted intervention, which means that he recognizes the market failure in the absence of capabilities. That there is a market failure there. Um, there is not the poor are poor not just because of a uh, lack of liquid assets. But the poor are poor because of the absence of the capacity to, or the discernment uh, to uh, view uh, the future as, pro as uh, progressive. And, and that is something that comes in your childhood. Um, we all start uh, with almost infinite possibilities in our uh, neuronal uh, endowments. But a childhood, even a fetus uh, that goes through a lot of stresses, may they be motivational, may they be physical um, or nutritional, <clears throat> will result in many of the neurons that are friendly to self-esteem, to, uh, to trust, being pruned early in the game, very early. By the time you get to school, that's too late. Uh, you, you have already been 50% crippled. And that is the importance of intervention uh, that uh, James Heckman was talking about. If you give more money to a household with an infinite discount rate, because tomorrow you could be shot and be dead, then the the, the allocation of this additional resources will not be different from before they got that additional resource. 
This is important because we're in in entering the Mandanas era. Mandanas means additional resources to LGUs. But if you leave the LGUs to spend, chances are their very short time horizon uh, will result in the same uh, allocation of resources as before. More basketball courts, uh, more um, whatever, more fiestas, etc. So uh, what I'm proposing is that the mandanas should be accompanied by a coletilia. And the coletilia is that part of the mandanas resources should be targeted to LGU school feeding, even preschool feeding, so that you arrest the possibility of neuronal uh, 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 deficiency already by the time they they get to school and when they get to school. So our four piece program, by the way, is on the money according to the, <laughs> to the uh, uh, James Heckman uh, talk. But we should probably do more. And I am an advocate of school feeding and preschool feeding, uh, uh, which I think we all should support. Uh, that is of course the, uh, the um, advocacy also of Senator Grace Paul. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fabele, to what extent do you think that we can, you know, uh, partner with the private sector regarding you know, the, the things that you talked about? Because obviously, as uh, Professor Manga has said and mentioned, we do need advocates, uh, you know, um, for the uh, direction and the, the things that we need and we cannot rely on government. And certainly there's like uh, institutions like SWS, they have their own uh, specific agenda that they have to follow. And But we are in dire need of advocates and partners. Um, and the only thing I can think of really right now is the private sector. Is, that, is there a way or how can we, you know, how can we engage them to be partners in um, these, what do you think, what, in these activities? What, what are your thoughts about this? The private sector's CSRs are already busy uh, reaching out to the marginalized sectors of society. The only, the only thing we can do is information. In other words, direct them to where their monies will have the greatest returns. And that is children, preschool and, and uh, on school. For me, they can help in the feeding of these preschool children and post school children. But the, at the moment, the more important resources available is the mandanas, it's from the government. The only thing is that we should, we should uh, 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 attach a colatilia that maybe 30% of that should be school feeding. Perhaps there's but more work is needed. That's 100 billion out of money. Oh, oh God. But perhaps this is a, this is the portion wherein uh, you know uh, agencies like uh, you know those that uh, Dr. Fo and Attorney San Luis belong to could you know could actively uh, work on you know to seek out uh, support and uh, and advocacies from the from private sector because as Dr. Fabelli had said you know these are uh, their CSRs are you know, already engaged maybe we can help or maybe your agencies could convince them to redirect some of these uh, CSR uh, uh, money. Uh, that maybe they could, you could, they could be uh, redirected towards uh, the things that you know that could develop the uh, the, ch the social emotional skills, etc., and all the, the studies that we need in order to uh, carve out um, more comprehensive and a more effective policy. Uh, any last thoughts before we yeah, go? It's almost eleven thirty. Yes, please, Doctor Mangas. On the Mandanas uh, ruling. I think I would like to have the LGUs individually responsible for reaching 100% minimum junior high school uh, status, re finished, finished junior high school status by the age of 18. That, that if they're not doing that, then they should not be, uh, no, somehow, 
what they're what they're doing with their money is not uh, you know effective if they're not getting all of their people all I would say you know finishing at least junior high school by the age of 18. Now that will require, of course, investing in all the earlier age groups, you know, from the from the yeah, so that they will finish. Because right now, right now, that's only about mabuti kung 55, 60 percent, you know, have finished junior high school by the age of 18. How do you expect them to earn, you know? Enough with that with that little low level of uh, of uh, of skills. So they should feel that if there if there if there are if there are you know elementary dropouts, even slight high school dropouts, they're failing. They're failing. They're failing. They should see to That's it. Right. But but to do that, of course, you need the food. You need the nutrition even right. before school and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, so that they will not. So that they will not fail, but that to me is the most, uh, uh, the clearest, you know, the easiest to measure. Make sure that they finish minimum ten years. Sana twelve, K right. to twelve. I believe in K to twelve, you know, K to twelve. But do, but no exceptions, no exceptions. Right. They can, they must, they must all graduate. Hindi pwede itong oh five years na pwede na. No, my good, that's what. That's right. I I, I, I see what you're saying, and uh, something that uh, that needs to be evaluated as well. And uh, uh, so much we can still talk about. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I was going to ask you for your final thoughts, but I don't think we have time for that anymore. But uh, let me just thank everyone, uh, Professor Heckman, who's not here anymore. But anyway, thank you. Uh, to all the panel members, Attorney San Luis, Dr. Fabella, Dr. Mangahas, and uh, Dr. Ho, maraming maraming salamat sa pag-attend, pag, uh, sa pag, uh, pag share no? so for sharing your thoughts and your views regarding the topic. Thank you so much. And I turn Hello. over uh, the program to Sheila, who will... Uh, We'll be taking over, <laughs> Sheila. Um, thank you, thank you, Avi. Thank you, Doctor uh, Asenis, for your excellent moderation of the webinar. And of course, again, our gra utmost gratitude to our main speaker, Professor Heckman, for a great uh, lecture and our panelists for their insights. Uh, just a few reminders before we close our virtual event. Well, we will make uh, the presentation of our Professor Heckman publicly accessible on the. DPR and, and uh, PIDS websites as soon as uh, we have received uh, his clearance. Also, please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will also send you the link to your registered email address. Uh, your comments are important uh, to us to improve our virtual events. Our next uh, webinar in, this, in the APPC webinar series is on Thursday, uh, September 15, on the topic uh, human capital development and social protection. So if you haven't registered for that webinar and the ones that we will conduct next week on uh, September 20 and September 22, please do so. So to register, just refer to the registration details available on the PIDS Facebook page. And finally, we would like to acknowledge um, the various organizations from the government, um, academe, civil society, business uh, sector, international development, uh, and uh, those from the media that join us today, uh, you can see the names of these offices on the screen. So thank you so much for attending the opening program and webinar one of this year's annual public policy conference. See you on Thursday for webinar two. Maraming salamat po.